how our brains respond to things that are in harmony or things that are in unison versus how our brain responds to notes that are dissonant. I'll give you an example. Okay? Um, this is a note in harmony or in, in unison. Okay? That's unison. Two different octaves playing the same, it's the same melody. And our brains say, that's good, that's right. But if I were to go, let's see, it'd be hard to do this. It's hard for me to even think this way. Okay? That's dissonant. If I were to go... That's harmony. Even though people have different notes, they sound good together. Versus... That's rolling. He'll get there. It's just amazing to me that God designed music that unison and harmony, it pleases our brain. Dissonance, just scattered notes, they are all, they're, frequency-wise, they are in opposition to each other. They bounce off and try to cancel one another out. Okay? That's how sound waves work. That's how music works. Uh, noise reducing headphones or noise reduction. You know what they do? They use certain frequencies of sound to block out other sounds. It literally builds a sound wall around your ears so you don't hear the sounds around you. It just cuts them, the sound cuts them off. Okay? And that's how it is in relationships between people, whether they are friends, brothers, sisters, married couples, church members, or whatever. We all have a different part to play, but if those parts are in unison or those parts are in harmony, it pleases everybody, and I think it pleases God. Okay? But if there's dissonance, everybody doing their own thing, usually it ends up being in opposition to one another, canceling one another out. Okay? Um, boy, it's good. Amen? I just like good music. I like studying it. Uh, let me do this first. Um, the book of James teaches us... Turn to the book of James. And I didn't... I, my apologies. I did not come prepared for this. I had a really, really busy afternoon. But we're going to anoint with oil and lay hands. Okay? Where is that? Help me out here. James 5. Thank you, Jody. And um, the Bible teaches us that if is any sick among you, verse 14, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of the faith shall save the sick. The Lord shall raise him up, and if he committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Okay? And uh, Jody has asked if she could have um, the elders pray over her, anointing her with oil. And um, she wants to be healed. Okay? And you know what I say to that. God's either going to heal you, give you something better. He always does. He'll give you grace. Who knows what God will do? But I promise you, Jody... It'll be better than anything you could have ever imagined. Okay? That's what I believe. I don't think that healing, physical healing, always has to be done just because we did what the Bible says. Okay? But I do believe what the Bible says, and I believe that God will heal her, or God will give her something far better, and she'll ta I know her well enough to know she'll take it. Okay? So, Jody, come on up here. I'm just going to ask, is there anybody else that just has a physical issue of some kind and you would like for us to anoint you 
and lay hands on you and pray for you. Okay? You want to do this, Laura? You and Jody, come on up. Okay? You'll be our test subject. Alicia, come on. Anybody else? Sure, Dave, come on. Okay? Watch out, Benny Hen, we're coming. Okay? So I'm going to ask uh, first the elder men if you would come. This is not magic. Amen? It is what God said to do. And, and anybody else that wants to come and just lay hands and pray on them, okay? I don't think there is a forbiddance of Scripture for anybody to do that. So you guys come on up. Any of you ladies want to come? That would be perfectly fine, okay? Won't you guys come sit here on the altar, all right? That way we can all gather around you, okay? So let's have God's people come up here, okay? Um, Alicia, what is it you're asking for? Okay. Laura? Okay. Have a lot of pain issues. Jody? Same thing. Dave? had three accidents in the last two years and pain. Okay. We're not getting any younger, are we, DB? Yeah, it takes, it, it takes its toll. Okay. Uh, does anybody want to help anoint? It, it doesn't require one special person to, to anoint. Okay. So, Joe, if you would... Take that, okay? Yeah, go ahead. Okay? You want to do this? You want in on this? Okay? Go ahead and lay hands. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Father, your word says that by, our, by your stripes we are healed. And Father, the greatest, the greatest healing that could be done, Lord, with these four that have gathered here, has already been done. You have cured them of what sin was causing in their life. Father, you have promised them that out of this body will come a new body, perfect in health. Father, it, it, no sickness, no disease, no pain, no tears, no suffering will ever come to these new bodies. So, Father, first of all, we just thank you for that. And, Lord, if that's all that you ever gave us from here to glory, Father, how could we complain? So, Father, we just thank you for that. And I know these four, God. I know their heart. I know they trust you or they wouldn't be here tonight. So, Father, we do care about their physical complaints. Lord, I know these issues of pain. I know them, Father. I've experienced them and still do. And I know, God, how it plays on their minds. I know, God, what it does to their emotions, how it affects their thinking, the decisions that they make, the things that they go through, Lord. Doctors, sometimes they just don't understand. And Father, I just pray, Heavenly Father, God, that you would deliver Alicia, Laura, Jody, and Dave. Father, you would deliver them from the pain issues that they have. Father, from all the side issues, Lord, that go on as a result of this. Father, that you would, if it's in your will, God, that you would send doctors to them that would understand, that would know, Lord, what it is that they're going through and would Seek out and find answers for them. Bring healing to them. Bring a cure to them. A procedure. Anything, Lord, that would help them get along in life. But, Father, we also know that you are the great physician. We ask you, Jesus, who knows our pain. You spent three and a half years going around and healing diseases. Those who were in immense pain. Those... Father, who were so bad off they couldn't even walk, had to be carried. And these four have been brought here by four. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The gospel has brought them here today, tonight. And I pray, Heavenly Father, God, I know you care for them. I know you love them. And I know you know the pain.
pain that they go through. So I pray, Father, in Jesus' name, that you bring healing to these. And Father, we trust you. Paul had a thorn in his flesh. Three times he asked you, Lord, to deliver him. And the Bible says that that thorn was a, a, it was a devil that buffeted him daily. You didn't take that thorn away. You gave him grace. And Paul recognized that it was far better for him to be weak and you to be strong in his life. Father, I understand all about that. And Father, there's things that you've helped me with. I thank you, God, for the surgeries that I've had. And the help that you've given me. But Father, I still, I go through it. And I pray, dear God, Lord, that you would bless them. Give them healing. Give them grace. Give them, Father, of the goodness that heaven has to provide. And Father, we trust you and we praise you already, Lord. Because you're so good to us. And you're not going to let these four down. You promised you wouldn't. So, Father, we trust you. We lay these things at the altar and we leave them here. Thank you, God, for hearing us tonight. We love you. And we pray this in the name of Jesus, our Savior, our Healer. And our Lord and all of God's people who are in agreement say, Amen. Amen. It's done. It's done. Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate it. Not a problem. I told you about the uh, pastor I visited in upstate New York. And... Um, Brother uh, Marino wanted that pastor to lay hands and anoint him with oil. And the pastor said, well, we'll have to go outside for this. And I'm thinking, what, is he not good enough to be anointed here in the sanctuary? What, does he like have to be a member? Does he have to pay money or what? And I was a little bit critical of that pastor until I saw what he did. He took Brother Marino out to the parking lot, got a bottle of oil like that, and literally poured it on his head in that parking lot. He didn't just go dab, he went whoosh. And I went, oh, I get it now, you don't want to buy new carpet. Because that's what he did. And I thought, Lord forgive me for being critical. I didn't understand. But amen. Appreciate that. All right, take your Bible. Turn to Revelation 20 and blame Mike and Laura for this. They were asking me yesterday, uh, we come home late afternoon, I was tired and, and uh, I had a lot of Sunday morning sermon kind of prepared and I was working on that and uh, I put together Sunday school and then I wasn't sure where I was going to go on Sunday night and they were bugging me about Pastor, what's the millennium going to be like? What, what is this deal about Satan being loosed at? And why is he being loosed after that? I don't get that. I said, Will you? And I said, okay, I'll preach on the millennium sometime. I'll teach on it. I was thinking maybe PMO or something like that. And then I guess the Holy Ghost just kind of led me in that direction. And I'm going, okay, this is pretty cool. Okay, So I'm going to stick with this. Revelation chapter 20. We're going to talk about what's called the millennium. Not the millennium falcon. Okay, but the millennium which is the 1,000-year reign of Christ. Now, let me explain a little bit about the, some terms you may have heard. Terms like premillennial, amillennial, and postmillennial. Who here has ever heard of those terms? Okay? Premillennial believes that there is literally a 1,000-year period where Christ literally is going to come down to the earth, going to put his feet on Mount Zion, He's going to build his temple. He's going to rule and reign from Jerusalem over the entire world for 1,000 years. And everybody's going to like it. Okay? Uh, that's pre-millennial. The word pre means that we believe that the uh, Antichrist and all of those things, those events happen prior to the 1,000 year reign. That's pre-millennial. 
um, post-millennial believes in a 1,000-year reign of Christ, but they believe that... I'm trying to, trying to remember how they put it. The new version of post-millennialism is called Kingdom Now. A lot of guys like, um, oh, Todd Bentley, the New Apostolic Reformation, the Latter-day Prophets and the Apostles and all that group and so on, they believe that Christ is going to reign, but he can't come down and rule until God's Christians, God's saints, have taken over the world for him so that we can hand Jesus the kingdom. It's like Jesus is going to show up and say, Okay, where's all the money? Where's all the, the, the keys to everything? I'm ruling now. Did you guys do what I told you to do? Okay, that's sort of the new post-millennialism. Amillennial. Ah there means eh. It literally, the A in front of millennial literally means no millennium. No 1,000 years. And I was trained in Bible college by an amillennial professor, okay, who actually knew more about premillennialism than I ever knew. But I was trained by an amillennial preacher, and Sterling, uh, there are a lot of free will Baptist churches that are amillennial. And when I hear these guys talk, I just, my, my jaw drops and I go, What? You believe what? Here's what they believe. They believe that the term millennium or thousand years, the literal phrase a thousand years in the Bible, does not actually mean exactly 1,000 years. They believe that it is a metaphorical term to describe a long period of time. And that's all it means. And it's an undetermined long period of time. They believe that we are already in this millennial reign of Christ. That Christ is reigning now. Satan is bound and cannot do what he wants. And then one day it's just going to end and that's it. That's all millennialism. They do not believe in a restoration of Israel. They do not believe in a rapture. They don't believe that there's going to be a time of tribulation. They don't, they don't believe any of that stuff. They believe it's all metaphorical. The term that I heard in the class I took on the book of Revelation, which I got a D minus. I barely passed that class. D minus. Okay? The term that I heard was that John was writing the book of Revelation in a style of writing called apocalyptic literature. That there were several other books written around the time of the book of Revelation that, uh, that all spoke of a great cataclysmic event taking place with the evil rulers being put down and the good guys taking over the world. And that, you know, there was all this literature going around at the time that basically dealt with the same thing. They believe that John was only writing the book of Revelation, to the people of his day. And they believed that John was writing in sort of a code language so as he wouldn't get caught going against Rome and the Caesar of Rome. So the Caesar of Rome is the Antichrist. Ooh. And the pagan priests are the false prophet. And John had to write in this secret language so that Rome wouldn't find out that he was actually talking about them. Now, let me explain something to you. John was somewhere around 93, 94 years old. When you get that old, you don't care anymore about what comes flying out of your mouth and who it bothers. Because you can't threaten somebody that's 94 years old with death. Because they're going, if you're going to kill me, you better hurry up. I can tell you that right now. Okay? But that's what they believe. And... Tradition, the Bible doesn't say this, but tradition says, history tells us that John was in exile on the Isle of Patmos. We know that for a fact. But he was exiled there because Rome tried to kill John. The Caesar of Rome tried to kill John. They found him guilty 
of sedition, and they put him in a pot of boiling oil and was going to boil him in that oil to death. And John lived through it. Now, I don't know what's worse, being killed in a pot of boiling oil or living through being killed in a pot of boiling oil. But the history tells us that when they pulled John out, he was still alive, and they figured, oh, this will kill him for sure. And it didn't. And so Rome realized, well, if we can't kill him, we can silence him. So they put him in exile on the Isle of Patmos, away from everybody else, so he couldn't harm anybody. And Jesus showed up and gave John the greatest picture of the future that anybody has ever, the clearest picture of the future anybody has ever seen. I believe literally every word in the book of Revelation is going to come to pass exactly the way God said. Amen? Including the 1,000 year reign. But that's all millennialism. They don't believe it. So Revelation chapter 20 verse 4. I saw thrones and they sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. I'm going to ask you a simple question. Would you be willing to have your head cut off for the sake of your testimony for Jesus Christ? Okay? That's not a... Not a Easy question, especially if you're young. When I was a kid, this terror, this terrified me. Okay? It terrified me. I was scared to death of this. But the older I get, the more solid I am in what I believe. And if you think I'm wrong and you want to cut my head off, you're just going to, you've got it to do. But I'm not changing what I believe. And as long as my head's on my body, I'm going to say what I believe. Okay? So, if, that happens to you, guess what? You get to live and reign with Christ for 1,000 years. Okay? Now I'm going to explain that. They probably won't get to it tonight, but I'll explain it. Revelation 20, verse 6. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him 1,000 years. So now you have two witnesses. Same chapter. One says that there is a group of people who are beheaded for the witness of Jesus Christ. They reign with Christ for a thousand years. Two verses later, blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. Do you know what the first resurrection is? Anybody know? The rapture. The rapture is the first resurrection. Okay? When Christ appears in the clouds, those who have already died in Christ are going to come up with that new body. You and I who are alive and remain, if it is us who are alive and remain, we're going to be instantly changed without death. We will be part of that first resurrection. That's the resurrection of the saints. Okay? And if you are part of that first resurrection, then you shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with Him a thousand years. So two different groups are described here. Those who are persecuted, have been beheaded for the cause of Jesus Christ, and then simply those who have been resurrected by Jesus Christ at His appearing in the clouds. The Bible says we also shall be with Him for that 1,000 year period. And we shall be priests. Not Catholic priests. Different kind of priests. Now I'm going to ask you a question. I don't have it in my notes tonight, but it's coming. What did the priests of the Old Testament do? What did they do? Every day, priests in the tabernacle did something. What did they do? They killed animals and burned them in the fire. Beasts. They took beasts, killed them, and threw them in the fire. That's what they did. Uh, you know what? I am, going to, I am going to talk about this. Turn to um, Second Peter. No, First Peter. Chapter 2. I knew there was a 2 in there somewhere. 1 Peter chapter 2. He tells you in plain language what this is. 1 Peter chapter 2. Verse 2. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. If so be you have tasted that the Lord is... How many of you tasted that? 
That's like that chutney I was talking about in Sunday school. Man, this stuff was good. I, I, I had the money to buy that jar of chutney. I had it. I just couldn't see paying that much money for a jar because I knew I would want more. If I got hooked on it, I'm going, $35 a pop, man, that's an expensive habit, okay? That's more than drugs, amen, okay? But anyway, so he said, I've tasted that the Lord is good. He's gracious, amen? Verse 4, to whom coming as unto a living stone. Is Jesus a stone? Yeah. He's a living stone. Anybody whose name is Livingston, that's where their name comes from. Okay? They were named after the living stone, Jesus Christ. I was sharing with them, remember this, your DNA, the book of life that you have, is a stone. It's a crystal. It is crystalline in its structure, therefore it is a stone. Okay? And it's made up of uh, things like phosphorus. Phosphorus is a mineral, which is a stone. And sugar. What happens to sugar when it's dried out? It turns into a crystal. It's a stone. Right? Okay? Christ is that living stone. DNA. Okay? He's the book. Amen? So anyway, uh, verse... Um, Verse 4 again, to whom coming as into a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also as lively stones. I want you to think, I want you, I want, think about this. Jesus said, in, the, in I can't remember where it was, maybe somebody can find this real quick. He was talking to one of the seven churches in the book of Revelation. And he said, he that overcometh, I will grant to him that he should be a pillar in the house of my God. Now, did Jesus literally mean exactly what he said? Sure he did. What are pillars made out of? Stone. What are we? Lively, living stones. And God is going to allow us to be a pillar in his house. The house, the temple of the millennium, the 1,000 year reign, is going to be built by Jesus himself. No man can build this temple because God won't dwell in it. Jesus himself is going to build it. And what is he going to build it out of? Us. Stones. Just like the stones of the temple that Solomon built. Okay? Okay. When Jesus said, see all these buildings, talk about the temple, I declare to you not one stone would be left on another. And when they destroyed that temple and scattered those stones, do you know that they also scattered every Jew that was living there? The Jews were the stones of that old temple. That was the old house of God. And as God allowed the stones of the, of the literal temple to be scattered, he also allowed the Jews to be scattered as well. See how it connects? We are the stones of that temple building. It is going to look like something that no man has ever seen before. Amen? Do you believe that? Because what is, what is it that we're going to look like when we're resurrected? Does anybody know? I don't have a clue. I just know it's going to be glorious. Amen? Oh, I like this. Yea, verse, yea, ye also as lively stones are built up a what? It means a house of spirits. And holy priesthood to offer up what kind of sacrifices? Spirits. Evil ones. Devils that are beasts. That are going to be cast into the fire for a thousand years. Okay? That's what I believe. That is what I believe, all right? And why not? Is that not what the scriptures say, okay? I have already heard the criticisms on this, and I haven't changed one bit, okay? So criticize away. So anyway, 
A thousand years. He's going to reign for one. Th Did I finish all that? Oh, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. He is the high priest. We are then going to be a priesthood of kings and priests in a spirit body. Um, did you throw a pen at me? Oh, okay. Just as long as it didn't have a knife on the other end of it, but all right. So anyway, let's look at this thousand years. The, question, the first question I have is, why a thousand years? Why is he reigning for exactly a thousand years? Why not 47 years? Why not 558 years? Why 1,000 years? It's based upon a number. Take your Bible, turn to Genesis chapter 10. You see how small that is on the screen? That's intentional. Turn to Genesis 10. God is showing you things. He's showing you patterns in the Bible. If you want to know what a number means, go to the Genesis chapter. Now, I don't have the answer for all of those. Okay? I just know the ones that I know, I see them in the Genesis chapter. Genesis 10 is no exception. Genesis 10 gives us the lineage of all the nations that are on the earth right now. And Genesis 10 is the very first place in the Bible where you find a king and a kingdom. Notice this. In Genesis 10, verse 8, Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord, wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord, and the beginning of his kingdom, notice this, was Babel and Erek and Akkad and Kalna in the land of Shinar. Notice, look at what he's got here. Nimrod is a king ruling over four cities. Dun, dun, dun. Principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness. The fourth kingdom. You're seeing here a picture of what the fourth kingdom is going to look like. There's going to be a king. There are going to be other kings, ten of them. Okay? Uh, in, in Daniel chapter 2, he's describing the kingdom. And he's describing the, the fourth kingdom. And the fourth kingdom stands upon these ten toes, which represent ten kings. The horns that are on the beast, how many of them are there? There's ten of them, even though he's got seven heads. I don't know how they're distributed. Don't ask me. Okay? But he's got seven heads and ten horns. And those ten horns represent ten kings. So ten is the number for dominion. So what do you get when you multiply ten times ten times ten? Thank you, Caleb. See, that homework and that math is paying off, isn't it? It's working. Amen. The prayers have been answered. Hallelujah. Okay, now turn to Revelation 11. Revelation 11. Can, really, can y'all read that on the screen? Can you? What about now? I'm making, I'm going to make you open your Bible. Wait a minute, I can't read it. Hang on here. There we go. Revelation 11, verse 15. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms, I like this, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Now watch this. The very first kingdom and the very first king was Nimrod. Nimrod was not a good guy. He's very evil. Okay? And there's lots of things in history about Nimrod, and I believe a lot of them. He was a very wicked king. Um, he literally instituted this Babylonian mystery religion worship system that still exists today in the form of the Roman Catholic Church, in the form of Buddhism, in the form of whatever idolatry and witchcraft exists on the earth. Nimrod and Babel, Babylon was the beginning of all of that. One of these days, I believe very soon, starting with Nimrod, and going forward to every king, every kingdom that has ever existed and is existing now and will exist at that day, all of them are going to be handed over to Jesus Christ. Amen? The United States, Canada, Mexico, South America, Australia, China, Russia, uh, the nations in Africa, Europe, 
you name it, the United Nations is going to be owned by Jesus Christ because he is King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen? Imagine, I want you to think about this. Think about all the strife that is going on in the world, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Think about the strife that exists right now, even in our own country. We have states now. We are a nation of little nations, little countries called states. Okay? Missouri has laws that other states don't have. Think about that. And I like Missouri. Okay? I plan on staying here. It's a good, so far right now, it's a good state. I like it. I like the laws. I like the governor. Things seem to be going well. We know what the devil's going to work against that, right? And, by the, and Reg Kelly's daughter is in Jefferson City, making sure everything's doing well. Okay? She won that thing. They didn't think she'd win. She won, okay? Now, here's the thing. All of the states, all of the kings, all of the kingdoms, all that fighting and warfare and bickering, all that's going to be turned over to Jesus, and Jesus is going to put stop to it. They're going to take their swords, their implements of war, and they're going to turn those into things that will feed people. Because people being hungry is far more important than people killing one another. And when we talk about fighting for our rights and fighting for our freedom and all that's well and good, but the truth of it is, anybody that's ever been in a war will tell you, it's not fun and games. It's awful. Taking another person's life, whether they be in warfare, whether it be police action against someone who is trying to harm someone or whatever, or a man defending his own home. I mean, I'll defend my home. I hope to God I never have to take somebody else's life. And there's going to come a time when all that's going to be done away with. I don't believe that there's going to be the murders, the killings, the robberies, the rapes. I don't believe those things are going to take place. The devil's going to be bound, literally, in the pit, the bottomless pit. Christ is going to reign, and his saints, in a spirit, spirit body, a perfect body, with a perfect mind, are going to rule with him, and they will judge righteously. Think about it. This judge over in Illinois that was a corrupt judge because he was a dopehead. He was doing drugs. Okay? And he got caught because another judge that he was doing drugs with took an overdose and it killed him. This judge was evil. This judge was judging the people in his county based upon the, his need for drugs. And he caught him. He's in prison right now and he should be. I don't think he got a tough enough sentence, if you ask me. During the reign of Christ, we as judges of the earth, we won't need drugs. We won't take them. We won't need money. We won't need food. We won't need liquor. We won't need anything from this earth. So nobody can bribe us. Nobody can tempt us. Nobody is going to have to worry about any of Christ's rulers and judges being corrupt. Because they'll rule righteously. Amen? This judge that made the decision about whether or not this cop was innocent or guilty, I don't know that he made the right decision. I, I'm saying I don't know that he made the right decision. I don't know. Did he do it simply because of certain ideologies or whatever, I don't know. But I do know that when God's saints are ruling on this earth, we'll know even as God knows. Think about it. We won't need uh, video camera evidence. We won't need the police to wear body cams. We'll know everything. 
and we'll judge righteously. Amen? You ponder that. Think about how glorious this world is going to be for 1,000 years. Adolf Hitler called his Third Reich the Thousand Year Reich. He copied it from Jesus. A world ruled by Adolf Hitler for 1,000 years. Can you believe that? It was a just war that we fought back then, wasn't it? That won't be during the 1,000-year reign of Christ. Can I hear you say amen? So the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come. By the way, my, our former Mormon brother, the God who was, who art and wast and art to come, that's Jesus. He is God Almighty. That Bible's right, amen? Because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. See, it's talking about Jesus. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath has come, and, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. I believe in capitalism. What I don't believe is the abuse of a free market by companies who rob and steal from other people and destroy the very resources that God gave us on this planet. I do not agree with that. I think it's terrible that they do that. Dump toxic chemicals into rivers and streams and even underground so they infect the well water. I think that's terrible, don't you? They are destroying. Our sin is destroying the earth. And Jesus is going to come and he's going to set all of that right. So that those who live on the earth will actually be able to live of the earth. And they'll not be tearing this world and destroying it any longer. That doesn't make us green. That doesn't make us liberals. It makes us right with God. Amen? Amen. I like this. Now watch this. Go back to uh, Genesis 5. Noah. See, we're dealing with number, number 10. Noah was the tenth from Adam. Okay, you have Adam. You go all the way down. We know that Enoch was number seven because Jude said he's the seventh from Adam. So Enoch gave birth to Methusael, I think. I don't remember. And then he gave birth to Methuselah. No, Enoch gave birth to Methuselah. Methuselah begat... Lamech, that's number nine, Lamech begat Noah. Noah's number ten. Okay, why is that important? Notice Genesis 5.32, Noah was 500 years old, Noah begat Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Matthew 24, okay, talks about the end of the world and what's going to happen prior to the 1,000 year reign. And so Jesus said in Matthew 24.14, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. The gospel that we preach is a gospel that includes the idea of a millennial reign of Jesus Christ. That Christ, Christ is coming back. Isn't that part of the gospel? And He's going to judge the nations. That's part of it. Because we tell people, look, Christ is coming and He's going to judge you. Are you, is, is he, are you going to be found guilty? Or are your sins covered by the blood of the Lamb? And so the gospel has to do with the millennial reign of Christ. So the gospel of the kingdom is going to be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. So he says in verse 36, But of that day and the hour knoweth no man know not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So Noah, and what happened with Noah, is a prefiguring of the coming of Christ and his and his 1000 year reign. Exodus 20. Turn there. I know you might get tired of turning in your Bible, but I know you might get tired of it, but I don't really care. Exodus 20 verse 1. Did you know that that is the 70th chapter of the Bible? 7 times 
10. And in the 70th chapter of the Bible, you have 10. Look at, look at it. God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which hath brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. So this represents the ten. Represents God's dominion over his people. Having removed Pharaoh's dominion with how many plagues? Ten. Pharaoh had dominion over the Jews. God took that back away from Pharaoh by causing ten plagues to happen. Ending the reign of Pharaoh, God then takes them to Mount Sinai, gives them ten commandments, and that is his dominion over his people. God now is in charge of Israel, not Pharaoh anymore, which is a picture of God saving you. God took you out of the house of bondage, out of the house of bond, of the land of bondage. God, there was a wicked ruler ruling over you, a devil that was trying to destroy you, and God removed his authority from you and put you under God's authority over you. Because we still believe in the Ten Commandments, don't we? Deuteronomy 10. And he wrote on the tables, according to the first writing, the Ten Commandments, which the Lord spake unto you in the mount of the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. And the Lord gave them unto me, and I turned myself and came down from the mount and put the tables in the ark which I'd made, and there... and. There they be as the Lord commanded me. The picture of Noah receiving the Ten Commandments that represents dominion. Noah comes down from Mount Sinai. Jesus is going to be given the law and authority. And he's coming down to the earth with ten thousands of his saints to rule for how long? One thousand years. And you and I, instead of us having to go... Uh, let's see. Let, let me judge between you. Uh, let me look in the book here first to see if I can find what scripture is relevant to your case. We won't have Bibles. We'll have them here. And we'll know them. And we'll know them perfectly. And we will judge according to God's holy law. That's beautiful, isn't it? Let me give you one more thing. The 1,000th chapter of the Bible tells you how to get into the kingdom. It's John chapter 3. Turn there. One thousandth chapter of the Bible tells you how to get into God's kingdom. John chapter 3, verse 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He can't see it. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very verily I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And then we all know John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You see, John chapter 3, the thousandth chapter of the Bible, tells you the gospel of the kingdom. is that Christ died for our sins, and if you want to be part of that kingdom, what do you do? You believe on Jesus Christ. Amen? I just think, that's, I just think that the 1,000th chapter of the Bible belongs as the 1,000th chapter of the Bible. It tells you to get into the kingdom. Amen? Now, here's your homework. Okay? Here's your homework assignment. Well, I got a lot more on this number 10, but it's, I'll just leave it at that. You're going to study... The kingdom. Out of the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew is the 40th book of the Bible. It's 4 times 10. Okay? It's a multiple of 10. And in Matthew, chapter, in Matthew, the Jews are now hearing for the very first time God's real plan of salvation and God's plan for an earthly kingdom. Okay? It's called the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. And they're the same, aren't they, Dave Bradley? See, we, we know what's behind all that, okay? Dispensationalism says, oh, the kingdom of heaven's different from the kingdom of God. I dare you to show it to me in the scripture, okay? I got a $5 bill for you. If you can show it to me in the scripture that the kingdom of heaven is different than the kingdom of God, it's not. It's the same thing. So your homework is to study the word kingdom in the book of Matthew. Every place... In the book of Matthew, you're going to study the word kingdom. Because from there, and I, 
I had a ball putting this together. Because I learned some things. I learned some things last night. I never knew before. God is going to teach you about that earthly kingdom. A lot of it He's going to teach you in the Gospel of Matthew. Now Luke, Mark and Luke are going to back Matthew up. But Matthew is the first one that really just nails it. Okay? So study the kingdom in the book of Matthew. The very first time it's used. From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent! For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's within reach. It's near. Let's stand to our feet. Mm, 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 mm. Uh, I'll give you something else to study too. Anything in the Bible related to the word thousand. Like the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. That's related to the kingdom, 1,000 year reign. Okay? Um, well, there's a lot more to it. Okay? How many Jews did Jesus feed? Five thousand. That's related to it. Okay? There's a story there. Because how many baskets did they gather up at the end? Twelve. That's all the tribes of Israel being gathered together, being saved. Okay? For the kingdom. Isn't it cool? So study thousand, study kingdom. Okay? And the word king with a capital K? Seventy times exactly in King James Bible. That Bible's not wrong, is it? Amen. Can I ask our visitor, Brother Taylor, if you would close us in prayer tonight, please? Thank you very much.